Today's episode of the Energy Question Podcast is brought to you by Inveris. The energy industry faces challenges every day, and the events of the last two years have caused massive disruptions like never before. Companies in the energy industry need actionable intelligence and a single source of truth that brings all the data together. Inveris is the energy specialized technology partner that provides intelligent connections for a global energy ecosystem. Only Inveris has the analytics, people, experience, and industry scope to connect the right data and and information in the right way to discover missed opportunities and deliver fast outcomes. Find out more at Inveris.com. That's E-N-V-E-R-U-S.com. Hello, welcome to the Energy Question with David Blackman. I'm David Blackman, and my very special guest today is Jackie from the Jackie Daily Show. Um, Jackie, welcome to the show. Great to be with you, David. It's been a while. It has been a while. It's been too long uh, since we talked, and I'm, I'm glad to get back in touch with you. Uh, the Jackie okay. Daly Show, for those who don't know, I have this wonderful bio I want to read okay. to introduce you, Jackie, because <laughs> okay. it's so impressive. Uh, for those who don't know, Jackie Daly Show is, is airs on Blaze Media. Um and here's the bio. I want everyone to pay attention to this. Previously, Jackie worked for an engineering firm specializing in energy production, national security, and environmental cleanup. She served as legal counsel on Capitol Hill to the chairman of the subcommittee on the Constitution and former ranking member of the Commercial and Administrative Law Subcommittee, advising on the oversight of federal agencies. Prior to her career in Washington, Jackie worked as a corporate litigator and as an assistant vice president for a national bank. That's that's some resume right there, Jackie. I'm older than I look, David. And it's a lot <laughs> to pack into a lifetime. Yes. <laughs> I'm afraid I look every bit as old as, as I am, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so so tell me about the uh, Jackie Daly show and 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 really how you got started uh, doing that and okay. uh, what you try to accomplish with your show. Well, I'll tell you, I worked on Capitol Hill for seven years in total, if you count both of my stints. And um, I became fascinated with this idea that we were dependent upon hostile countries for our energy, which is the foundational input into the economy. I was working for an oil and gas man. We were doing investigations into um, terrorism finance. You find out a lot of it comes from oil and gas countries around the world, petrostates in the Middle East or North Africa. Yeah. And uh, and then I learned that the Saudi ambassador could just walk into the White House whenever he felt like it, while the CIA director had to wait for a meeting for a year under Bill Clinton. I was learning <laughs> facts like this. I'm like, wait a minute. What is going on? Like, How are we going to be a superpower into the 21st century if these are the dynamics? And then I learned all about the fracking revolution and realized this is our chance to really stay dominant for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Um, you know, on Capitol Hill, as T.P. Pickens said, you could exhaust the, the knowledge uh, of oil and gas in a U.S. Senator after about five minutes or less. People up there don't know anything about oil and gas. I happen to be working for an oil and gas guy. So I saw this dynamic and he was part of the grid caucus, the EMP caucus to secure the grid. Um, I learned a ton from him and I realized no one is messaging appropriately yeah. on oil and gas. Now this was like 2012 or 2013. It's been a while ago. And so I thought there's a huge opportunity and this is my contribution to what we call the war on terror, which is a silly title. We, we don't war on ideas. Really, we war on people, frankly. Yeah. Uh, so I don't even like the term war on terror. Uh, but the point is that was the fight of my generation. You know, I was in law school uh, when I watched live the second Twin Tower be hit and go yeah. down. And so for me and my generation, that was the Pearl Harbor moment, you know? And so I was like, what am I doing with my life? You know, I'm up here on Capitol Hill, which is a lot of fun, uh, but you're in the trenches, you're fighting, and your superiors are always saying, people, it's all theater. Don't come out guns a-blazing. You know, don't get all worked up about this. It's all theater. And I just became disgusted with that. I'm like, yeah. I don't want to do theater. I didn't go to law school to do theater. So I will not be muzzled easily. So I thought, what is 
what is the best use of my talents? Only talk radio rewards my skill set, right? Corporate America muzzles you. Uh, Capitol Hill muzzles you. <laughs> I, I'm just like, I don't want to do that anymore. So yeah, the, there's an extraordinary yeah. freedom in in this format, right? I, I was yes. also a corporate guy and, you know, muzzled for years on what I could say for good right. reasons. And there's good yeah. reasons for that. But, right. but yeah, there, there's so much freedom in talk radio and podcasting. Right. And that's what it was about for me. It was about saying what I want to say, messaging on something critical that was I thought was being missed in the debate. And not only that, I'm my own boss. I mean, I can do a podcast from... Antarctica, if I want to, I'm not chained to a location or a schedule. I do what I want, what I want to do it. So, you know, that all appealed to me and um, it's been a lot of fun. I cannot believe I get paid to do this actually. <laughs> yeah. I covertly recorded one from, from a cruise ship last October. So right. Yeah. You can right. do it from anywhere. Right. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to talk about ESG today. Um, and uh, that's a, a topic near and dear to my heart. I've written an awful lot and talked a lot about ESG over the over the years. And I, I'll never forget uh, in 2007 when the company I was working for, the general counsel there who I was reporting to, received our first letter from a from an ESG investor firm making all these demands. Uh, this firm owned less than one percent of the company's stock, and. Uh, you know, but uh, uh, the, the the management team met and asked my advice on what they should do with it. And, you know, I stupidly said, well, you should probably tear it up and throw it into trash because if you do all these things uh, for this investor group, then next year you're going to get another letter that's going to be much more demanding than this one. And it will never end. You'll just every year it'll get more and more demanding and you should probably just ignore it and convince all your peers to do the same thing at other companies. Um, be that as it may, my, my advice was soundly ignored and uh, and uh, all the companies started responding to these letters and, and gave these investor groups, a, as a result, an awful lot of power on, on their operations. And uh, I mean, what, what's your impression of the ESG phenomenon as it stands today, I guess, as a, just as a first question? Um. I will tell you uh, in full disclosure, since this is not a cable news network where I where I <laughs> avoid answering your question and say what I want to say, um, I will tell you that overall, I am negative on the movement. I'm not negative on the aspirations. Right. I mean, all, all of us, all of us care about the environment, about treating people fairly, uh, you know, and not discriminating against people. Or, or transparency and good governance. Absolutely. Everybody yeah. believes in that. So it sounds great, right? The mission sounds wonderful. And personally, you know, I'm, I'm young enough to say, I want to invest in companies that behave in ways that I believe are appropriate. And I don't sure. want to invest in companies that don't behave appropriately. So I'm not opposed at all to individuals investing in exactly what they believe is right. So if you are, you know, um, a very strident environmentalist and you believe the claims of the green movement about solar and wind or whatever, good for you. Invest your money any way you want. It's none of my business, right? Um, that's, that's completely wonderful and fine. And if you lose money, that's your problem, not mine, right? But if, but if you get into the movement, the ESG movement, it's really not about all the time, the things that I think they claim they're about. I don't think there's truth in advertising in this movement. Uh, there's so much in the way of greenwashing. So you'll see an ESG fund, you know, kick out Tesla, but bring in Exxon. Oh, uh, yeah. I uh, God, and, what a ridiculous thing. Yeah. So I say, I say, and look, I think Exxon's a fine company, but I would say to the millennials who are, who are paying three times the fees to their investment manager for these so-called green funds, you might want to dig deeper because that's what you're investing in. You know, this is what's going on. They're calling it green to your face, but who knows what's happening in that fund unless you really check the homework. Right, so right. There's, there's some truth in advertising problems with it. And why does that happen? This is about rigging the market. I think with false promises, sometimes it's about advantaging certain groups over others. 
And, um, you know, even on, on corporate governance, like, you know, we're, we're a pro-woman fund, and then you find out the companies they're investing in actually have fewer women on the board <laughs> than the average American company. So, so my first problem with it is I don't like that it's undefined. You know, every bank that has an ESG uh, scoring matrix and a, and a board that talks about the decision decides differently. So it's not objective criteria. We don't even know. We don't even agree on what we're talking about here. This is a very nebulous, like nailing down jello. Right. There's no regulations. No, there's no uniformity in guidelines or anything. No. So you're, it's, it's a very waffly uh, thing to start. But the other thing is, I really think it's a threat to capitalism because what it's doing is permitting companies to put something other than profit uh, first. Now, the ESG group will, group will deny this, right? The advocacy groups deny this. They'll tell you, no, it's not that we it, like, sure, we lose money sometimes compared to traditional investments. But in the long term, we are looking at political risk, right? We're looking into a crystal ball. And we're telling you that 100 years from now, uh, oil and gas assets will be stranded. So you don't want to be invested in that because it will have been, you know, we will have invented away from it or moved away from it or whatever. Right. As if, as if they can accurately predict <laughs> the actions of thousands of governments around the world, you know, even uh, two months from now, much less decades from now. So <clears throat> I think it runs up against reality sometimes. Um, and the idea that a sophisticated investor would accept an explanation like that as being rational is just, it, it just isn't. Okay, it's political. And so there's so much money. And for example, the green movement, I mean, it's calling for the redistribution of trillions of dollars yeah, in trillions. Wealth over, over a long period of time. People want to get in line for that. The way that the corporate world and financial world thinks is how do I get in line for that? Right. And they know that, you know, an estimated 68 trillion with a T dollars will be transferred from the older generation to the younger generations shortly. So millennials, for example. And so they know that that group is green and they want to appeal to them. So from this, we get this movement. And as I said, they make three times the fees sometimes on some of these green <laughs> transactions. So of course they love them. Uh, of course they'll find a way to label it green. So this is the issue. Um, let, but you know, let's think about like uh, the danger, like real danger to you and me from this movement. Um, there's a great white paper out that I commend to everyone's reading, Corporate Collusion, Liability Oh, yes, lists. That, that was my next question, yeah. This will get into some of the, the real harms that can happen if we don't pay attention to what's happening. So corporate collusion, liability risks for the ESG agenda to charge higher fees and rig the market. This is by the Texas Public Policy Foundation. It's authored by C. Boyd and Gray, who's a former White House counsel. And... It goes into antitrust, fiduciary duty, and tortious interference with contract as just three of many types of laws that could be violated where you are using ESG investment criteria in a way that lacks integrity. So um, as a quick example, I mean, antitrust is not something- Yeah, talk about antitrust because I think that's a real key finding in that study. It's huge. And, and so few Americans really understand antitrust law. Um, basically, it prohibits competitors from colluding with each other or entering an agreement to either fix prices or divide the market up or to do a group boycott to divest from or harm a certain business or industry um, in the marketplace. So what you want, what the government wants is competition. That's great for everybody. But when, for example, U.S. banks get together and collude and say, we will as a group divest from oil and gas or coal or firearms manufacturers or whatever it is, um, that is a boycott that if they, if they uh, did an agreement and did this as a group in lockstep, almost certainly violates antitrust law. And so 19 state attorneys general have taken notice of this and said, listen, big, fan, big fund managers, asset managers, we're going to find out, are you being pressured, let's say by an outside third party activist group that's coordinating all of this 
um, collusion to destroy U.S. oil and gas, because that's what's going to happen. I mean, in good times, this country can be the number one oil producer on Earth, the number one natural gas producer on Earth, the best coal producer. We have a lot of advantages, and these are geopolitical tools that would keep us from being dependent on foreign hostile nations, like what's happening with Germany right now. You don't want to be the next Germany relying on <laughs> no, Russia certainly don't. to stay alive, right? <laughs> and so we've been, you know, it used to be OPEC. Um, now we actually rely on Canada probably more than anyone else as far as a foreign uh, supplier. But the point is, you want to be self-sufficient. We've learned from COVID. You don't want your supply chain for anything, especially a critical commodity like oil, gas, or coal to be controlled by someone on the outside. Right. So, and, and you don't want your strategic petroleum reserve drawn down for political purposes like President Biden did over the last year, correct? Exactly. Exactly. The, people understand, especially after the, the 1970s oil embargo um, and then COVID too, right. why it's, it's amazing to be self-sufficient. It's even better to have other countries reliant on you for those commodities. These are our bargaining chips at the you know, UN or geopolitically. So we don't want banks or others breaking the antitrust laws to try to divest from US oil and gas. I mean, this is really serious, right? So that's a major problem. The attorneys general are on it. Um, and so we- Well, we and, and, and Texas Comptroller Hager, right? I mean, yes, just yes. recently, I guess in October, announced uh, that, that the state's going to penalize a, a, a fairly long list of these investment groups for discriminating against oil and gas. And and that TPF report, TPPF report, uh, really was a driving force behind the passage of that law in 2021, wasn't it? Uh, I certainly hope so. Yeah. I mean, I I wasn't, I, I don't spend much time in Austin down there <laughs> in the Capitol with the, the reps, but um but yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, Texas Public Policy Foundation is highly influential oh, in the yeah. capital. No and um, so, so truly led the way in crafting a law that says, if you divest from the Texas oil patch as a policy, then Texas will divest from you, big bank. And that means you don't get to handle our bond issuances, you know, manage our pension fund as a fiduciary or or anything else. You don't transact business with the state. That is a ton of money. That is hundreds of billions of dollars we're talking about. So that really mattered. So even Larry Fink came to Texas, had in right. hand, he said, whoa, I'm not anti-oil and gas. Whoa, I invest in oil and gas. Yeah, you sure do. You know, he's on the board, but what is he doing on these boards? Or, you know, I mean, uh, not on the board, but he's, He's a mega investor, but what is he doing as an investor, as an activist? Frankly, he's pushing the ESG agenda, which essentially calls for um, the industry to commit suicide, right? They're asking oil and gas companies in their public statements and in their policies to slowly go to net zero. Well, this is a carbon company, right? This is a company that produces hydrocarbons. So it's, it's, um, for him to say, look, I'm involved in oil and gas, that's true. But that doesn't mean that he's a friend to the industry. And by the way, this doesn't do anything to stop the consumption of oil and gas worldwide. All it does is kill us, the number one competitor right. for OPEC, Russia, and other hostile regimes, and enrich them. Do not expect Russia and petrostates like Saudi Arabia and Iran to go to net zero and commit suicide with the one industry that supports their, their, their country, actually. I mean, Russia's budget is more than 50% oil and gas funded. It's their top export. They are, you know, you could call them a petro state, just like uh, most of OPEC. So all we're going to do is harm ourselves and help others. What we see is that consistently more and more oil and gas has been used year by year by year. World population is growing, demand is growing, and if you want to restrict it before you have any serious, realistic alternative to replace it, people will be harmed. You know, people will be hurt. People will die if they don't have energy sufficiently uh, to fund their hospitals, you know, to fund their schools, to, to have agriculture be enriched with like natural gas-derived fertilizers that can quadruple crop yields. I mean, what are we going to do 
if we really don't have these commodities. This is right. real harm to real people. And it's and, going to harm the most vulnerable. Yeah, and, that, and that's one of the great ironies about this whole energy transition thing that uh, we hear so much about and it's, it's such a, a cause on, on the political left these days is that last year, I just wrote a story about this at Forbes, uh, last year, uh, the world globally used more coal than ever in, in power generation. It burned more wood, a 16th yeah. century technology, right. than yeah. ever on record uh, for power generation and used more oil and more natural gas than in any previous year as well. And and those numbers are only going to increase again this year. And that's in spite of this this fervor to invest trillions of dollars in subsidies for wind and solar and electric vehicles. And, um, you know, it's hard to see how that doesn't put us on a path, path uh, to, to national bankruptcy um, right. <clears throat> with, with, with those kinds of levels of spending. Yeah. And for so little in return. Yeah. I mean, it's truly primitive technology. Right. Like if you look at Germany, they went head first into solar. They were the world leader, basically. Um, that was way back 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. When when solar panels cost about 90 percent more. OK, so that was a really bad investment. If they would have <laughs> waited 15 years. You could have got 90 percent more out of solar panels, which still can't begin to make sense mathematically or financially to replace. Uh, fossil fuels, but at least don't invest in something that is primitive. And we know, I mean, you know, 20 years from now, what will a solar panel do or a, a wind turbine or, you know, who knows? I, I will never underestimate humankind. We will continue to invent and improve everything. Maybe it makes more sense at some time in the future, but let's look backward 15 years ago when all those technologies were rolling out and the federal government and European governments had these huge subsidies for them. They told you way back then, David, that oil, gas, and coal would be stranded assets in five years. Right. Ten years. Yeah. Fifteen years. Well, here we are. Do you know, we, we I are. mean, I know you you probably talk to people in the oil industry all the time, like I do. I don't know anyone who believes this stranded asset argument. No um, one does. And yeah, no one, no does. one believes that. Anybody who's in the business that, or, or even truly most government agencies once in a while will throw out a report that concedes that, you know, even the EIA uh, or the U.S. Uh, or the International um, Energy Agency also, right. IEA, easy to confuse the two. But <laughs> both of them will tell you, uh, look, we're right now we're at about 80 percent fossil fuel usage globally. And like by 2040, it's going to be like four percent less. Yeah. yeah, it's it's by very 2050. It might be down to 75 percent, maybe that. Yeah. And those are that's not me talking. That's not you talking. These are nonpartisan government agencies that are on board with most of the green agenda. But they're telling the truth. I always direct people to take a look at Michael Moore's Planet of the Humans documentary. If you have a child or grandchild who's extremely hostile to fossil fuels, uh, extremely strident in their environmentalism, Please tell them to watch uber liberal Michael Moore's Planet of the Human documentaries. I mean, this thing is amazing. I watched it three times and took copious notes because here you have a committed, a very liberal environmentalist saying, look, what I set out to do was show the world how we're going to transition from traditional fuels to renewable fuels. And he finds out his, the hypothesis that he ends up proving is that the environmental movement is hijacked by corporate America. Yeah. And that these promises that they're making can't come true. They cannot possibly come true because the math and the science don't work. So I thought that was very powerful. And you know it was powerful when like he got banned on several platforms, of course. Uh, yeah, but Michael you can't Moore. find it. Yeah. But you can't find the video still. Uh, and it does a really entertaining job of showing you, pulling back the curtains behind these representations. Um, so you know, so I'm not, you know, I, I don't know. I don't want to say I'm anti-ESG because people think you're anti-environment, anti-social justice right. or good right. governance. No, what I'm talking about is having integrity and honesty in a movement. I think, you know, if, a, if an oil and gas company wants to put out a statement about how environmentally responsible they are 
and friendly they are and how good their policies are, wonderful. And they you all know, do right? that. They all emphasize that on their websites and in their, their releases. And, uh, you know, what we found out uh, in our companies back when this all started 15 years ago was that we were doing most of that stuff anyway. We just right. weren't putting it in a sustainability report, right? right? So now everybody's got their sustainability reports and that's good. That's fine. But but all the money spent on producing those reports is money taking away from producing energy. Right. And uh, so, you know, it's it's fine, but it's it's a it's a money sink and a time sink. And uh, you know, it's it's counterproductive in that way. Right. But right. you know, your your point about messaging is is right on and the how the media treats this. And I just wanted to bring this up today. I, I wrote a story this morning about a Reuters piece that was published yesterday about ESG. And it's it's the headline is anti-ESG drive in the United States could have cost taxpayers up to $708 million, according to a new study. Well, who conducted the study? It's a group called the Sunrise Project, Never which is been. a radical left-wing group that describes itself as a global network of change makers who believe in the power of social movements to change the world. Well, that's all great. That's all great. But is that uh, uh, an unbiased source of real information about ESG? And, but but that's the kind of, of thing that, that's in Reuters. That's a Reuters story, one of the, you know, the main drivers of news in the United States. And that's the kind of misinformation that the media spreads about all this that makes it awfully difficult to overcome. You know, I used to read Reuters a lot uh, when I first started yeah. my show and I quote from them and I thought they had great reporting. I read them less and less and less, actually. Oh, no. it's not my favorite source anymore. Uh, I've, I've moved on. i moved yeah. on. Uh, yeah. But, you know, so, so okay. Uh, first of all, I, I'd have to read that report. I can't dream <laughs> of what they're talking about or what argument they could be making. But what I can tell them is this. Um, and again, going back to my TPPF corporate collusion, um, part of the white paper is talking about how ESG criteria costs us huge money, particularly uh, if you are a pensioner uh, or if you hold your, an ERISA plan, right? It's a private sector plan uh, regulated by the federal government. If you find out that your pension fund manager has been you know, playing politics with your money, throwing your pension into you know, green investments or whatever, who knows if they're really green uh, and losing money, well, you might have a private right of action to sue the pension fund and the managers. If you find out this was ESG um, uh, governed rather than moving according to the standard required of a fiduciary, especially under ERISA, right. which is that you, you invest with the sole purpose, with this one eye toward returns on investments for the pensioner or the beneficiary. That is it. You don't get to say, Sure, this investment makes a lot less money, but we're doing something great for the planet. You right. don't get to do that. And so there's also private rights of action there where you can sue. And um, <clears throat> as you know, the ESG uh, enthusiasts went way out of their way to put out all these studies about how ESG investments do better over time <laughs> because uh, they take into account political risk. Well, if you look at the methodology, typically they only look a year or two or three back in time during those really good Trump years where the market's exploding, okay, and say, look how well we did. Right. Okay, well, let's look back 10 years, 15 years. Let's go through some cycles. We know the market goes through cycles. How do you do in times of, you know, crisis, like a war, right? There's a war going right now between Russia and Ukraine. This causes commodity prices to go up generally. Uh, war is inflationary. People don't have money for luxury items like solar panels on their house. Frankly, it, is, it should be a luxury item. If it weren't subsidized, it would be. It's so expensive. Um, but the point is that these are real harms to real people. I'll give you one example I can do just from memory. Uh, there was a study that came out looking at the New York City pension funds, and there are several of them. And um, this was uh, an example where the pension fund invested something like 12% of its assets 
into something called a green activist fund. <laughs> Whatever that means. What in the world does Maybe that mean? Maybe it was mean? the Sunrise Project. I don't know. Yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> it sounds scary. So, of course, while the rest of the market was booming, this fund lost 600 points. Okay, massive loss. Massive loss for New York City pensioners. Yeah. Okay, that's outrageous. That's an outrage. You should, you know, do you realize that there's a, um, a study about the market as a whole? If you invested in the U.S. stock market from its advent, uh, from then until now, on average, you would return about 11% a year growth, even including the depression, even including recession, because over time, over time right, the market yeah. grows, population grows, pop, market people are markets. You know? So basically, even with the bad years, you're bringing in 11% a year. What pensioner would not be delighted to have their pension fund grow 11% a year, which is what a lot of the fund managers will or, or pension managers will promise or base their calculations on? That's crazy, right? That doesn't happen typically. And so that's why they're chronically in crisis. They're chronically low on money. It's always a controversy. And then the union has to go fight. And then we may get a big photo op with a big agreement. It's based on some unrealistic projection of returns. Well, <clears throat> When you have examples like that New York City example and people who've been harmed, those are not wealthy people. They are putting their money into that fund, trusting it will be there later. Right. And, and what's supposed to be happening is, you know, maybe these are, these are working class people who don't have college degrees and don't study the market. They have put pension fund managers in charge who are supposed to be experts. These are supposed <laughs> to be people who know what they're doing. Uh, who they're trusting with expertise and they don't, it's not like the average pensioner is watching what the pension fund manager is doing. They can't tell you what decisions they've made over the past year. And so all they know is they show up one day and say, uh, we're out of money. So that's a major problem um, for yeah, and it's, the it's everyday a, person. Yeah. And it's such a violation of the fund manager's duty. I, I you know, it's just, it's really a heinous thing and, and a really, uh, bad byproduct of all of this focus on politics and, and climate hysteria. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid we are running up against the clock, Jackie. Uh, these half hours go in a real hurry here. Um, but but thank you so much for appearing with me and let's do this again sometime soon. Let's do it. And you're always invited to my studio. I'm not that far away. I, 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 fact, I think I'm coming up there in a couple of weeks, actually, to yes. record. Yeah, yes, I'm really looking great. forward to that. That'll be fun. Likewise. All right. Well, thank you so much. And that's it for uh, today's show. Thank you all for joining us. And thanks to our incredible producer, Eric Perrell. I'm David Blackman, and that's all for now.